Brother Chair, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I call this brief paper, well, brief for now, because the more I read, the more I see space for expansion. But I call this brief paper, Politics by Other Means, Tim Hector on Arts and Culture. I know that time is short, and there may be, and without doubt, a number of other people who would have a lot more to say than I. But I really would like to thank the organizers <coughs> of this conference for their invitation, or as a matter of fact, for their acceptance of my proposal that um, our deliberations here take a look at Tim and his positions and interpretations of the arts and culture and their roles in economic and social development generally, and politics specifically. We heard from the organizers last night, and at risk, I would like to say a special thanks to Dr. Paget Henry, whose fingerprints are all over this conference. I've been forced to read the available works of Tim Hector, and I've noted not for the first time the immense respect Tim had for Paget and his scholarship. He had nothing but sheer praise for Paget's work, commencing with his doctoral thesis, Peripheral Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Antigua, which I'm proud to hold an autograph copy since 1985. Paget. I still treasure it. I really do. <laughs> so effusive was Tim's praise that he ended his comments by suggesting that no Antiguan and Barbudan can lay claim to be educated, that is rooted, who has not read Dr. Henry's history of Antiguan and Barbudan. I was only last night to reminded of a tale of one of our fellow performers at the Antigua Grammar School who, with parents or family overseas, boasted of his acquisition of a number of glossy self-help texts on techniques for passing examinations, none seemingly indicating that you had to complete and understand the coursework. So armed with techniques and no knowledge, failure was assured. Why I remember this? Well, the pleasure of spending the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks reading Tim the two volumes of Fan de Flame, along with the work of C.L.R. James, Manley, Lamin, Netterford, Cabral, etc., that has become so absorbing, had become so absorbing that I had to tear myself away in an effort to write this paper. The insights of Netterford, in particular, on arts and culture and politics, do not very much from Tim's, but their approaches do. One from that academic cultural practitioner paradigm, and one from the academic journalistic position. They make very interesting comparisons, how they end up at the same points through different routes. And if I get a chance to invest in this paper, I may illustrate one or two examples where this happens. I've had calls on these ACLM L. THMC platforms to address the issues of cultural policy and without reinventing the wheel or without me having any particular updates on my thinking of a year ago, I still see culture as the more or less dominant spiritual expression of the ever-changing matrix, that ever-changing matrix of environment and politics and economic forces, what impact these have on human life and the effects on the interrelationships between individuals and groups or individuals and classes within a given society or region. The interrelationships are in many ways usually defined in political and economic constructs, that of leaders, followers, or teacher, student, or the, the rulers versus the rule, the employer, employee, the upper or middle class, lower class, the idea of parent, child, where in all these relationships there tends to be 
one that is dominant. And the dominant nature within these interrelationships, I think, is what defines our culture. And what gives rise to, uh, what encourages, and what enhances particular and peculiar expressions and behavior. The culture may or may not, and if it doesn't do it, then it is not dominant and remains part of, of, of what Bratwit refers to as the, the, the little tradition, the, the, the essential, the culture on the ground, essentially. That the culture may spread to an entire society based on the dialectic and the series of other values existing in the various spheres of our social arrangement. And that the dominant culture in a society is therefore that equilibrium that's achieved between the expressions of major institutions and major other sectors, other factors. I do not wish here to, to, to get into some of the fine distinctions that Tim's mentor, C.L.R. James, offers us in his 1959 essay, The Artist in the Caribbean, where we find indications of, uh, this is C.L.R. referring to the artist, or he refers to the great artist. He refers to the master artist offering subtle distinctions between all of these. And finally, he refers to the supreme artist. But sufficient, I think it is for us here to extract from Sailor's writings, and therefore that, that, that precursor to a lot of Tim's thinking, that the, what, what the capability of the artist is, and essentially what role does the the artists, the artists perform. And I quote, C.L.R. James suggests that by a combination of learning in his own particular sphere, observation, imagination, and creative logic, he can construct the personalities and relations of the future, rooting them in the past and the present. Seller continues to suggest by economy, by the, that economy of means, which is great art, the artist adds the sum of knowledge of the world. And in doing this, as a general rule, he may add new range and flexibility to the medium itself that he is using, essentially suggesting that the, the performance within the art itself, within that structure, also helps you to refine that structure itself, to refine that means. And I'll talk a bit later about the means to, 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 to what Tim talks of, of humanizing the Caribbean society. I think it's important, however, that CLI emphasizes that a supreme artist exercises an influence on the national consciousness, which is incalculable. He is created by it, but he himself illuminates and amplifies it, bringing the past up to date and charting the future. I find maybe there is, well, maybe I'm sure there are, but I have found up to this point in time in my reading of Tim, no particular definition or, or some sort of specific understanding of the concept of politics. He writes a lot about politics. He writes a lot about, about the, 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 the destruction, the failure, the successes, whatever it is of politics. But in terms of pinpointing exactly what it is, he means by this concept of politics, I am, it, 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 it's, it's suggested. And maybe for us um, and this discussion, that we may simply cling to some elementary, rudimentary might be a better concept, decisions about, about what politics is. Classically seen, it suggests that it's the art or science of influencing people's beliefs on a civic or individual level. 
we may choose to extend that definition to include a practical sense of, of, of our practice of democracy so that we end up with a view of politics being the way we choose government officials and make decisions about public policies. Of course, there have been a number of other very short definitions of politics, just simply the art of the possible, or uh, Harold Laswell's suggestion that politics is who gets what, when, and how tends to be fairly simple understanding. <laughs> Let's not forget at this point in time the mission in, in, in this discussion. That is, we, we, we are aiming to identify Tim's approach to that relationship between art and culture and politics in our Caribbean society. And in typical fashion, in a Timian style, which essentially perhaps is a style of many of our great writers and historians. Um, Tim takes you back to the beginning. In his work, in many instances, he takes you back to BC times. I won't do that here um, in, in, in this attempt. Um, but Tim suggests very early that the history of the Caribbean is a history of dispossession as continuing and enduring as it is stifling. One infers from a lot of his reading, from a lot of his writings, that this history, this history of the Caribbean, essentially began during the Middle Passage where some human traffickers paradoxically, this is very interesting, paradoxically allowed dancing really the jumping up and down to the rhythms of metal shackles of enslaved persons as exercise to preserve their health, to preserve their value on arriving on the other side of the Middle Passage. And while the men danced, the women sang, according to Tim, mournfully, tearfully, and began communication with others of different mother tongues. It is Tim's view that as early as this in our Caribbean history, as early as that slave ship, music and dance had found their way into the arsenal of weapons, and I'm quoting him now, to burst the Gordian knot of that paradox asunder. Slaves and slave people Tim claims, made the unlivable live. Sorry, made an unlivable life livable by reliance on their own traditions, values, and practices which they brought with them from Africa. Let me say that again. That slaves, Tim claims, made an unlivable life livable by reliance on their traditions, values, and practices which they brought with them from Africa. The collection of traditions, values, and practices is what we tend to rudimentarily describe as culture, isn't it? So that this gives culture in our Caribbean society a specific role, one that Tim's refers to as humanizing, and he uses this term a lot during his writings, concept of humanizing, that the effort to humanize, however, can only be described in political terminology. It is the struggle against those forces that deny our humanity, that retard the possibility of full growth and engaged potential. It's about understanding that all of these retarding forces, however, are politically controlled. The economy, the media, the education, thought, the laws, the full apparatus of state. The arts, therefore, in terms of most cultural thinkers' world, are products of culture. They are not the culture, they are products of the culture. 
and are most valued by their contributions to the humanizing process that we have witnessed and we have also already assigned to culture. But this human that we are talking about, this, 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 this supposed humanized slave, is not a one-dimensional being. The, the, the results of the humanizing efforts is definitely not to produce a one-dimensional character. And so the humanizing process itself, culture, must therefore offer contributions in that process to his or her social and spiritual, and economic, and certainly political well-being. See, this broad thinking allows Tim, within the same essential understanding of arts and culture that he espouses, that he thinks of as humanizing, it allows him to find the rebellious music of Miles Davis as important as that of Louis Armstrong, who defined his own music as in the service of happiness. Tim finds without problems that the entertainment value of Kitchener and obstinate do not in any way pale in any shadows to the socio-political work of Lester Shortshirt and Shadow. To him, they have equal value in the humanizing process. Tim has no problems discussing Ravel's Valerio in the same sentence with brute forces cantata. His, 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 his thinking and his, his wide view of the possibility of contributions from art allows him to do that. It is not a shuttered view. It is not an expectation that artists and culture must behave in any specific way. It is a view that they must contribute to the humanizing process. This thinking gives Tim quite a lot of latitude in the choice of his topics, in his reviews, and in his use of literature and journalism to warn to illustrate, to teach, to teach what Tim suggests, that the end to which all life must tend is the realization and liberation of self. But he adds a rider, and he says, through individual and collective creative effort. This is where he heads. The, 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 the realization, the full realization of potential of our life is what essentially is expressed and becomes expressed through collective creative effort. We therefore get views of Tim's thinking, not only through his assertions, but also through the thinking of the artists to whom he chooses to pay tribute to the quotations he uses from them, from them and from others, and to those he recognizes as standards of excellence. Standards of excellence in his world, in Tim's world, in Tim's understanding of that synergy of art and culture and, 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 and politics. He was an internationalist without doubt, capable of similar emotional reaction to European artists of the early century as he was to contemporary African artists at home or in, in, in the diaspora. He had an immense respect, if you read him closely, for all Caribbean artists, many of whom he did not share the same political view with. But this was countered in him, in, 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 in his wisdom, by what he seemingly perceives of the artist's preparedness to at least challenge what Tim extracts from Bolt, from, 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 from the playwright Bolt, and refers to what this terror of silence. The evaluation 
the, 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 the love, the respect comes primarily from the artist's effort to challenge and to counter this, ty this terror, this tyranny of silence. The evaluation of their art, however, for Tim is a different act. For evaluation requires standards. And Tim had standards about artistic expressions. Tim had expectations, and Tim had a lot of values within the, the, the aesthetic by which he critiqued, by which he compared, by which sometimes he brutally decided what was good and what, and, and, and what was bad. I talk. I talked theater for a while. I, I, on this stage, this, this place has so much wonderful memories for me. Um, I remember that mixture of trepidation, trepidation and, and excitement we felt in the Harambee Theater when word spread backstage, either on this side or that side, that Timbolo out there. His judgment of our work tended to be around a simple key question that he always asked about artistic performance. The question he always asked was, was it worth doing? It's as simple as that. Was it worth doing? The caracal and the bacchanalia and all the hours of rehearsals and the wonderful lights and Perhaps, etc., boil down to that simple question as far as I'm concerned. It's one of his standards. Was it worth doing? That, in many ways, I think, pushed us to deepen during that period in our theater its relevance. And maybe unknowingly at the time, improving our own contributions to this humanizing process that Tim highlights repeatedly. But we also came to understand by further interaction with Tim that his theater standards also included admiration for the European playwright, Bertolt Brecht, who sought and I quote here, to explore the theater as a forum for political ideas and the creation of a critical aesthetics of dialectic materialism. Breck warned his audiences, he wanted his audiences to adopt a critical perspective in order to recognize social injustice and exploitation and to be moved to go forth from the theater and effect change in the world outside. This is part of Tim's consciousness of, of, of theater and, wh and what that art, what that art should be doing within that humanizing process in any society. It is the same Breck who would have told an inquisition in the United States the following. He said to them, they were trying him on some sort of anti-communism, McCarthyism, Simi Dimi, and he says to them, the ideas about how to make use of the new capabilities of production have not been developed much since the days when the horse had to do what man could not do. Do you not think in such a predicament that every new idea should be examined carefully and freely? And Brett concludes to them, art, can present clear and even more nobler such ideas. It's part of Tim's, Tim's, Tim's thinking. We, 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 we learn this in his writings from the number of times he refers to, 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 to Breck. Tim's, Tim's, Tim's writing is at times nearly a, a, a miasma of quotation. As, as, as he searched this, 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 this wide knowledge he has, this wide readings, the wide readings that he knew, to find within them 
those positions of people he admired that supported his argument could also be the other way around, of course. Those persons whose arguments made him like them, made him support them. His theater also included the work of people like Robert Bolt, a man for all seasons, as playwright, someone known for his dramatic works that place his protagonists always in tension with the prevailing society, wrote Bolt and quoted Tim. Suppose I were to draw a dagger from my sleeve and make it kill the prisoner with it. And suppose their lordships there, instead of crying out for me to stop or crying out for help to stop me, maintained their silence. That would be token. I would betoken a willingness that I should do it, and under any law, they should be guilty with me. So silence can, according to circumstances, speak terror. It is, it is, it, it, it is, it is the value in terms of artistic expression or in terms of the arts, that Tim puts simply on expression, regardless of value and quality, expression in itself. Tim clearly sees the arts as a critical vehicle to this challenge of silence. He recounts a conversation in one of his columns with a cocky white American who he ended up on a plane with, and whom he shamed into recognizing that James Cameron's movie, Titanic, was an indictment of American civilization as heartless, cruel, hedonistic worshipers of wealth in itself and for itself, and driven by unprincipled selfishness. Tim, in his obviously tongue-in-cheek way, recounts that even after feebly agreeing with him, the American wondered out loud, but do you really think Titanic was a comment on American civilization? Tim's response is but a brief scalpel. Brief. Tim's response to him is, all works of art are, he said, all works of art are comments on our civilization. And that comment, and this is me here, I've jumped from Tim, and that comment must include always the political. Tim's theater also included the folk and the poetics of Walcott. It includes the brave Minshall, who challenged the stereotypes of sequins, lamy, and feathers, and in its place brought a new social and therefore political consciousness to that festival, carnival. The Breath of Thames' understanding of literature, however, is remarkable, it's frightening. He's also clear on its role in the humanizing process. His admiration for Edouard Glissant, for example, born on Saint-Marie um, in, 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 in Martinique in 1928, who had become one of Tim's favorite writers and thinkers. He gives us insight into Tim's understanding and therefore the standards by which he evaluates literature. Glissant asked in his writing, can literature make one forget grief and injustice? Or rather, in literature, is literature inextricably tied to grief and injustice so as to be able to point them out and fight against them? Tim's answer is equally clear. I'm inclined to think, he says, that all serious imaginary writing is tied inextricably to love, grief, 
and Tim adds injustice to Gleason's question, injustice. And I would therefore like to suggest to you, even if Tim did not do so overtly in his writing, that any analysis of justice or injustice is political. And so Tim finds common ground with Lamin, another one of the persons whom he admired. In Lamin's understanding as Caribbean literature, as being the story of the development of a peasantry fighting constantly for approval, for, for achievement, a house for Mr. Biswas. That type of thinking is what defines for him, through Lamin, the, the whole idea about Caribbean literature. He finds strong support, however, for his espousal of the single purpose, sometimes that inability to be able to separate the aesthetic from the political. He finds a lot of support in a remarkable essay called The Emancipation, Juve Tradition, and the Almost Loss of Pan by Lovelace. By Lovelace, who explained that just as steel ban was showing us the inventiveness, dedication, and genius by which we were to be liberated. The bad Johns who created it were displaying the violence we needed to confront if we were to lay claim to the liberation. In other words, to lay claim to the aesthetic, you had to claim the political. Tim knew this, Tim knew that, and so felt that the aesthetic, the platform for artists for the production of cultural products must address the political or he could lay no claim to it. I am here reminded of the simple way of putting what I just said in English. How the hell does anything advance without being part of a political agenda? One anonymous blogger asks. I remember about 30 minutes, um, this is where I was about to stop my talk, except I just want to react, if you give me one minute, please, or two minutes, to Brother David last night. Like Brother David Abdullah, who in his question and answer period last night, admitted a possible serious omission in any analysis of Tim's value if such discussions on cricket were not included. I found, too, after leaving here last night, that I had not paid particular attention to that important aspect of Tim's writing and thinking, especially in the context of the interpretation of culture that occurs throughout his work. Tim sees cricket as a means West Indian people use, and I quote, to humanize themselves. As he also saw music, as he also sees music and dance and literature and the theater as an integral part of the process that liberates from the physical and social shackles in which West Indian society was born and bound. Tim is sure that cricket in the West Indies, and I quote extensively here, is more than a game, more than popular art. West Indian cricket is part of the process by which West Indians overcame or sought to overcome racism and the consequent sense of racial inferiority and racial contempt in which the majority of us were born. It is part and parcel of the nationalist movement. West Indies cricket, according to Tim, is part of the process of national liberation in the Caribbean. So you understand, David, why anything that threatens West Indies cricket with a capital C as he knew it, as he helped shape it from deep within its bowels, anything that threatened that, threatened as far as Tim was concerned, national liberation. Be that threat come from abandoned cricketers with apartheid South African connections on an English team in 1986, which Tim interestingly opposed. As he opposed, we understand last night, David's boycott of, 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 of Parker. 
It is one of the challenges of interpreting Tim. In that in so many instances, he is his own evaluator. His own evaluator of the management of West Indies cricket, of which he was a deep part. His own evaluation of the role of the media in the region, of which he was a major part. Of his evaluation of the policies and successes and failures of the PLM, of the ACLM, of the UPP, of the ALP. I think it is subject, however, for another panel. This is subject for another panel. I think one definitely needs to look at Tim as a maverick organizational man. That merely sought an oxymoronic thought. Tim, who understood the Marxist imperative of organization, but whose thinking could not be bound by organization. Certainly not unthinking organization. Two minutes. Two minutes. I think he lasted long in the UPP. But back to cricket. And I think it's here you see evidence of Tim's understanding of the similarity of the core values of the role of arts and politics, theoretical politics that, are, uh, that is. His writing on sports, particularly cricket, occurs during a period of commercialization of sports, a period wherein which sport as an elite practice reserved for amateurs became sport as a spectacle by professionals for consumption by the masses. No one is attacking cricket here. The writer says sport. But it is in this transition in sport that has horribly gone wrong in the Caribbean that gives us 2020 cricket that horrible ab 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 abomination. <laughs> for when sport or art, or for that matter, and some do interpret sport as performance art. When it fails to contribute to the humanizing process, its relevance is devalued. I do not think that Tim would have loved the explosion of 2020 cricket. That is my sane mind at work. But something still lurks in the background. That for all I know, Tim might have found reason to like the game. One, because it came out of cricket, his cricket, and to any resistance to it was resistance to the child of his cricket, notwithstanding the whoring with dehumanizing capital and sponsorship money. Cricket fans, however, should not feel lonely. Out there in the land of commercial, non-humanizing sports, you can also find wrestling, you can find beach volleyball, you can find lingerie football, among others. But back to the issue of arts and culture and politics. Tim in his analysis of Al Calypso suggests, as everyone here knows, there's a concerted effort to drive the political out of the Calypso art, either by force, namely censorship, or by less crude coercion regarding the sugary in competition by placing them as high as possible. And in summary, I quote extensively from Mr. Hector himself in closing the argument. He says, I want now to move to the politics of art. Since there is a determined effort to make us believe that politics diminishes art, when art, in fact, is politics by other means. Politics, says Mr. Hector, is the means by which we regulate our relations, economic, religious, legal, and social relations, one with another in society. It is the way we see the world and our place in it. Art is the effort to interpret the world and to make people see how their place in it is being either engendered or enhanced. All art either seeks to accommodate us to the world as it is or to move us to change this world as it is for the better. Therefore, says Tim, then is all art politics by other means. Those who seek to take politics out of art are in truth taking art out of art. I thank you very much.